Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Talking Tricks. And today, uh, we have a very special guest on. Uh, Sean, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, what's up, everybody? Um, name's Sean Kosick. Been tricking for since 2011. Um, I'm uh, affiliated with Neo Motion, formerly SGTF, Samurai Gator Task Force, for anyone that's old enough to remember that. <laughs> um, in affiliation with Team Everyday Heroes, probably you know another throwback as well. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you overall, just, just older. Yeah. I, I think your age is showing here a little bit, but um, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but that's perfect because that's the subject of our episode. Because all of us are from the same generation of tricking, um, and we're starting to kind of age out. Like, gonna be honest with you, kind of washed up now, and I think this is an important discussion to have. Because yeah, in the in the immortal <laughs> words of Alex Hunter, uh, post peak. Yes, post peak. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, I think some of us could could get back up there, but I don't know. It's, it's a little late for me. I, I haven't tricked in so long. <laughs> I'm doing like yeah. 12 I'm, hour I'm days refusing and... to accept my post peakness, and I'm trying to do everything in my power and slightly failing, yet also <laughs> slightly succeeding. So... Uh, you're doing backside twelves. It's pretty sick. So. I don't know. Yeah, it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Job. You know, the so, new generation. Yeah. They they start with 12s. Yeah. I think we're all roughly the same age, right? So I'm 27, I think. I'm 27 or 28. I forget. But one of those. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that so hard. I'm tw- I, I'm 26. And the only reason that I know that so confidently is because I just had a birthday. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> so if I didn't, I would have to go and check my driver's license. I'm 27. Time. Go on, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jason, how old are you? 27. Uh, 27. Uh, 26. Turning 27 this year. Oh, like, we're all like, like a couple five. months. Yeah. We're all like exactly the same age. So, uh, so the interesting thing about this is like the first thing I want to hit on is kind of the physical aspect of aging and tricking. And to be fair, I don't think any of us really like we're still in good physical shape i think we're like we're a couple years out from 25 where we were technically at our physical peaks but it's not going to be far enough where we're feeling that yeah i mean we see like mateo doing crazy shit and dennis franco and stuff like that they're like older so dennis franco is doing triple b twist and he's like 30 something now so i yeah and he doesn't have a gym floor apparently (laughs) it's crazy like he just all trains largely in grass as well yeah, so honestly, we don't have really an excuse in that front. Uh, that being said, I personally feel some of those physical effects. Like, I do not feel as flexible as I once was. And I still stretch pretty regularly, so I don't know about you guys. I no, I, I've never stretched. I don't stretch <laughs> nearly as much as I used to, but because I spent so much time stretching when I did trick, I just never, lo- I, I never lose my splits or anything. Mm-hmm. So... I, I feel like a I feel like uh I really lucked out. I did like the nice. one bit of training really hard that just sticks with you forever. All mm-hmm. of my all other aspects of training though, like you know, hi- heightened aerial awareness and uh, being able to jump really 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 high, all that great stuff that goes away pretty quickly. Yeah. <laughs> that extra strength, God, I can't lift weights like anything anymore. But yeah, those splits, I stick around. Damn. Lucky ass. Um, how do you feel, Sean? <laughs> Dude, I let myself go, man. It's been like probably a year <laughs> since I've actually did some serious tricks, or at least took, took it seriously in terms of uh, like mm-hmm. training my body in a, from a physical standpoint. I mean, I don't stretch yeah. really much anymore. Um, I do lift at the very least, but uh, mm-hmm. only maybe some of that transfers over to you know tricking longevity. But that yeah. stretching is probably the biggest thing. That and you know actually going out there. And, Doing, it. doing the dang thing yeah stretching is also the biggest limiting factor for me because it's like if i don't feel like i can get by I, this is just a personal thing if i can't feel like i can get my kicks over my head i'm like what's the point of doing this so i don't even bother doing the tricks until i'm like flexible enough and i'm not so that being said what you said about the gym i think is very important because I will say that the times I've been away from tricking and I don't go to the gym, I feel so much worse than if I stepped away from tricking and then I was still going to the gym and working out. Like, I don't feel exactly how I was when I left tricking, but I could tell that I was able to maintain a little better, if that makes any sense. So, I don't know. I think that's an important part. 
I, I can just tell now, like, whenever I do, like, a swing cork or, you know, like, anything that once upon a time it would have been simple and easy and it really wouldn't have taken a tremendous amount of strength. I wouldn't have felt it at all. Now I can, like, feel it in my hamstring in, mm. in, in a way that I never could before. I'm like, holy fuck, what the hell? That's scary. Yeah. It's horrible. <laughs> But uh, in terms if of, I wasn't such a bitch, and I actually lifted weights like everybody else, then I probably wouldn't be a problem. But honestly, it doesn't even, like it helps. Don't get me wrong, but like I still feel the exact same shit you do, and <laughs> I, I, I lift pretty regularly. But um, I don't know. Like I, I think I also just have really chronically tight hamstrings. Like I've always had tight hamstrings, and it's just like so much more apparent now. And I'll strain it, and I'll just be out for like a few days. So mm. it's a great time. <laughs> I love getting old. Um, but it's funny I, that like, it, I think just relatively speaking, we're all, you know, 26, 27. That's you know, in terms of the grand scheme of things, it's not really that old, but then mm -hmm. I think after a certain amount of years tricking your, your body feels maybe 10 years older than what it actually is. Tricking shoots you up and spits you out. Yes. <laughs> and it's, from like my perspective, I mean. I had a good run when I was about 25, you know, your, your peak, you know, performance years. Mm. And a lot of my time was not even really spent tricking. It was doing stuff outside of tricking, stretching, mm -hmm. lifting, you know, eating properly. And then I had maybe what, six hours a week, I think to train, which, you know, it yielded great results, but you know, six hours of training required maybe, you know, 15 hours, maybe of lifting, stretching a lot of things that were, involved and necessary in order to you know not be overweight um stay healthy in terms of you know avoiding injury um mm -hmm. and you know having a, a proper amount of strength so you don't you know same thing hurt yourself yeah absolutely and in terms of uh what you said about taking a toll on your body i remember whenever my, my mom would say that to me she'd be like oh you're tricking and that's gonna like hurt your joints when you're older and i remember just always telling her like that's bullshit mom shut up like you're in a hurry shut the fuck up and... mom you don't know what you're talking about <laughs> like, Come on. my and angsty right, teen face my knees and ankles hurt Sure. Yep, yep. So <laughs> hit me up, guys, if you guys need knee replacements in the future. I got you. Um, but yeah. I'm waiting until we get the fucking mechanical ones so that I can be a cyborg and then I'll return to tricking again. You know, I'm low key thinking if that's going to ever be a thing. Like, I would love for that to be a thing, low key. <laughs> but also, I see the dystopian future. Sorry, go on, Jason. I was going to say so Sean brought up like the fact that in the grand scheme of things, like, we're not very old. Um, and kind of took it in a direction I didn't expect him to, but I would, I felt like this would also be kind of relevant, is that uh, being a 25 or 25 plus year old tricker is actually kind of old in the context of tricking. And I think that trickers typically peak, uh, depending on when you started tricking, uh, in their like late teens, early 20s is when, you know, you, you have like, it's like the optimal age for tricking, in my opinion. Um, yes, very few people actually wind up hitting their peak at 25, and there are a couple of reasons why I could speculate that on, on that being, but I think it actually has a little bit to do with your the, the immortality of youth, that just being capable of just taking a tremendous amount of damage and not having to do a huge amount of recovery stuff to still be capable of, you know, doing things. Kids mm -hmm. famously do that, but, you know, try doing that famously at 25. Famously made of rubber, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Try doing that at 25, and you'll find it. Uh, tremendously more difficult mm -hmm. um so i think uh yeah i think i now granted that means that if people had incorporated into their routines a good recovery a good recovery habits and re recovery routines theoretically we could see more people who are actually hitting their peak at 25 assuming they didn't accumulate a tremendous number of injuries before then but yeah. I, there's i think i think yeah a, as long as the forces that we see at play in tricking are at play uh, people unlikely to spend their time doing recovery stuff when training stuff is more exciting mm -hmm. and unlikely to stop themselves from training when they're injured because we all know uh, yeah. it, it's unlikely that we're going to see people who are hitting their peak at 25. So, See, it's also interesting what Jason and Sean said because while I do agree that most people are hitting their peak in their like early 20s maybe, I think tricking is interesting in the fact that like when you look at Olympic gymnastics, like a lot of those people, like 
by the time they're 19 or 20, like they're done. Like, you know what I mean? It's like that, that's like their, their peak. And then after that, it's like, okay, they're like retired gymnasts. And like, you don't really see a lot of gymnasts in their late twenties, like still really going hard with it. And I think that's stands in like indifference with tricking because like you see a lot of people in their late twenties, maybe not like, you know, absolutely killing it, but they still very regularly trick. So I don't know. I think that's an, I, I, I do feel like tricking to a degree is pushing the limits of like, oh, like you can actually do this if you're older, as long as you, you know, rehab well. And I think we're fostering that kind of, uh, I guess, a community as well with Trick Strong and other things that make us mindful of how we train. So I, I think I think a lot of part of it, too, is like changing the way people feel about tricks. We've talked about this a long, long, long time ago. But like when we're younger, we're probably more interested in like going out and getting all the hardest tricks and like going and being a badass motherfucker every time we show up to the session. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, over time, what we realize is more important is our ability to like have longevity, have longevity and to have fun with our friends. And that kind of mm -hmm. changes the way that uh, it changes the way that people trick it, or at least it mm -hmm. changes the way that they actively trick at a session. But because they bring their value judgments from their younger tricking life forward into their adulthood, they sit there and recontextualize the way they trick now as being shitty. Yeah. Right. And that sucks because that's not true. Right. It's not, it's not the case that if you've aged out of your peak or if you've simply changed your priorities from being a professional athlete to being someone who just enjoys the sport with their friends, it's not the case that the way you tr you trick now sucks or that what you're doing now is just complete shit compared to what you were before. You mm -hmm. have different goals. You're doing it for a different reason. You're doing it differently. And contextualizing what you have right now in front of you as lesser than you had before is what's making it not fun and what's mm -hmm. making you feel like it's you know not something that you could do into the future i really think that um i really i really think that there's a way to sit there and view what you're doing now like we we, we kind of had this conversation before uh, the call started but sort of as the continuation of your hero's journey you're not in the stage of being a champion anymore, but that doesn't mean that your role in the story isn't important. In fact, it can be, you know, depending on how you choose to view it, depending on how you choose to contextualize it, you could be the most important cog in the machine. Mm -hmm. So it, and that perspective on what you're doing is a whole lot healthier than the perspective, ah, I'm washed up and useless. I might as well just go and do something else. That's not very healthy and productive. Yeah. So I agree. That's sort of, I that's sort of the mental aspect of aging. We've got the physical aspect of aging, which, you know, mm -hmm. that's going to happen to everybody. And you can deal with it in different ways. You can increase the amount of time you spend recovering. You can change your diet, your sleep. You can change your, your training routine to be less intensive. Uh, but all of that is going to be a moot point if you're not able to contextualize what you're doing as something positive, as the, you know, the correct next step forward for you. If you don't do that, mm -hmm. then you're just going to be viewing yourself as, you know, going back, going in reverse when that's not actually what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think that um, so before we actually take a deep dive into the mental aspect of tricking, the one other thing I want to bring up about the physical aspect is also just like the time that we have throughout the day. And maybe that doesn't count as a physical aspect, but like I find that actually playing way greater of a role, at least in my opinion than like how our body actually feels. Um, Cause I don't know about you guys, but I just started in the clinical space and like, you know, I'm doing like 10 hour days sometimes and then I have to go home and I actually have to study and like maybe I'll get a workout in that day. And it's like, at what point am I tricking? I can't, like if I had my ideal day, like I would be spending time stretching and then watching samplers to get ready for tricking and then going to trick and then like, you know what I mean? but. It's just not possible sometimes with an adult life. So that's a good point. I mean, I'm a mechanical engineer, and um, most of my day revolves around sitting in front of a computer. And mm -hmm. there's, though I work from home, there's opportunities for me to, you know, break up, you know, my time sitting down by, you know, maybe stretching or going on a little walk or something like that. But, you know, depending on the occupation that you have, if it's not tied to tricking or some kind of physical activity, there's a lot more work you need to do because your body is just, at least in my circumstance, I'm just sitting at a, you know, I'm sitting at a desk. I'm 
rigid. I'm just staying in one position. And so there's a lot more opportunity just for strain, like muscle strain, getting hurt because there's not, I'm not actively moving my body around um, mm -hmm. really in any way. Yeah. But you are still actively doing something. Uh, you know, your brain, your brain uses like roughly like a third or a fourth of the calories that you burn. And when you're sitting there doing something mentally intensive, it uses a lot of energy. So it's not as simple, you know, even someone in your situation, it's not as simple as telling them like, hey, just like pick an hour in the middle of your day and go trick. It's like, I'm sorry, I'm doing something exhausting all day. Mm -hmm. The prospect of going and doing something exhausting in the middle of that to then come back to doing my exhausting work is, you know, that's not that doesn't sound like a fun time to me. Oh, yeah, that's a good perspective, too. It's the like what you're saying. It's just there's a lot of mental energy that's involved. And it's surprisingly it, when you get off work and even if you're not actively physically doing anything, you still have that, you know, uh, lethargic feeling after mm -hmm. getting done, like the same way that, you know, you could be, you know, walking around and like working at like a shop or something like that where you're constantly like using your body maybe not necessarily using your mind but you're using your you know physical body to do something but then the exhaustion still feels the same you know depending on it doesn't even matter what occupation that you have you're just tired at the end of the day absolutely yeah, yeah absolutely i was gonna say that uh i have being in like the it space i also spend a lot of or like the majority of my day sitting down um and it is exhausting. Like the last thing, like at the end of the day that I want to do is, you know, go expend my energy further when I could just go home and relax, you know, mm -hmm. um, especially after like a particularly stressful day, which just occurs, you know, every now and again as an adult with mm -hmm. a, you know, real life job. And so I think Frank really is kind of hitting on like the primary point that, you know, having the time and, uh, you know, it, like it is hard when the the peak time to go train outside would be like midday mid afternoon or something but you can't do that because five out of seven seven of those days you are working and then the other two days are for like literally resting or catching up on other responsibilities you have outside of the tricking we should have a four-day work week that's all i'm saying anyway um no but i yeah i agree with you guys that it I think another part we also don't talk about is actually the mental expenditure for tricking itself. Because I don't know about you guys, but like I can go out and like maybe I could do a TD rice cork if I really want to. And that's not that bad at all. But the moment I have to think about like, oh, OK, let me think of this combo or OK, I came up with the combo I want to do. Now let me think about how I want to execute it or like is my leg going too high up is this other thing happening there's like so many aspects to think about when tricking especially doing novel things or even doing something you haven't done in a long time that we also just don't think about <laughs> so yeah. beyond that too i think even just the like the entire preparation for a session is kind mm -hmm. of exhausting as well as an adult like you know that was a ritual sure. for me but back no, in the day and it, and it was <laughs> for me as well but uh, like yeah. even even just trying to do certain things like oh i have to make sure that i have my ipod as well as my iphone in case i want to record and play music at the session you know i'll making sure you have all these things like mm -hmm. you know just ge in general prepping is a lot of work as well and you know i'm just lazy as an adult. <laughs> i never thought about it like that too because i think i was just making the point of just the amount of effort you have to do just to do for just training your body but then mm -hmm. i didn't think about you know what my pre-session ritual would be. I mean, I got to figure out what sampler I need to watch, mm -hmm. uh, what flavor pre-workout I want to take, um, yeah. <laughs> what, you know, what, you know, what little uh, dynamic stretches I want to start off with and then, then actually make the drive to go to the session. So I guess realistically, yeah. you have maybe 20 or 30 hours outside of tricking each week uh, mm -hmm. spent either thinking about stuff, training your body for tricks, and then you know maybe four hours of actual tricking that happens each week yeah yeah exactly and th that's another thing too is like the time spent in, in prep for the session could also be like travel to the session because that's another thing that i hadn't really considered like in mm -hmm. my case all of my gyms that are like provided adult open gym are like 30 minutes away so on top of a maybe one to two hour session i have like an hour of driving mm -hmm. and i mean and in my case that's actually pretty good like i know some people would drive much further for us for like a couple hour session but mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I got two hours just over in general. Here. So. Well, and then and then you know you get like you get out of gym 
of adult open gym typically like late at night as well and you've got mm -hmm. work the next day and uh, <laughs> yeah. it's yeah yeah well, I, I have work the next day and god forbid you injured yourself at that session yeah yeah seriously that's true yeah i'm on my feet all day for for work usually or for clinicals i should say so i could not imagine doing all that with like my back hurting or my knee hurting or that sounds awful like i i literally do make sure that like i feel good for walking around the fucking hospital like the next day so yeah also in terms of the sampler picking process that's totally like like when you have your food and you're trying to pick the right youtube video and it takes forever <laughs> and then your food gets cold it's <laughs> that's what it feels like <laughs> like i need to find the right sampler right now um but yeah so i i don't know there, there's a lot of things to consider there but um i i think the other part of uh mentally aging and tricking is just like trying to be in touch with the community because that's something i also i i try to do as much as i can mostly because i can't trick anymore i'm like okay might as well be part of the community because i love these people but it's still hard for me to like you know half the time in clinicals half the time i'm thinking about oh like what do i have to do for studying or like i'm just thinking about medicine all the time and it's just like i don't have as much time to just like scroll through instagram see who all the killers are and be like comment on every single one and then like you know be active in the community so it's and I want to, but it's it's hard, you know. I feel the same way about keeping up with the tricking Facebook group. It's so mm -hmm. much to the point where I just I have given up on looking. To be honest. There's nothing on there anyway. It's okay. It's just towels posting weird shit. <laughs> so so we're so we're we're about to move on to uh, aging gracefully from like the perspective of like the community and your social interactions. But before we get off of the individual aspect, is there anything else? Uh, that anyone has to say about that. I mean, my, my thoughts, uh, I made them clear a little bit ago that I really think the most important thing here for your own internal experience individually as a tricker as you get older is mm -hmm. to stop seeing yourself the same way that you saw yourself when you were younger as like, you know, this, this, this person who's going to drop like a bomb at the session and explode and become the hottest new shit. It's like you, you had your time for that and that was fun and everybody gets to spend their time uh, as the champion going through the new world. That's, that's a great part of your life and you enjoy it when you're in it. But when you're no longer in it, mm -hmm. um, going and pretending like you are still in it is, you know, it, it's like an adult in an extended adolescence. It's not mm -hmm. good for you. It's not healthy for you. And it's not actually the most fun that you could be having right now. Mm -hmm. It's not fun to be an adult who's acting like a child. There are mm -hmm. more there are more fun adult things that you could be doing in as an as an adult. And that's kind of the perspective that I think people should be adopting more. Don't sit there and say to yourself like, "Oh, I'm not a young killer champion who's going to go around and land three new tricks this session." Yeah, mm -hmm. that's not what you're here for anymore. You're doing something different. Bryce, you, you really ground me because I just realized that we just talked about all the shitty things about getting old and tricking and then just offered nothing. Like, we were just like, yeah, it sucks. All right, let's move on. Like, like, <laughs> I, 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 was, I was trying. I was trying to bring us back. <laughs> no, but you, you're right. You bring up a really good point that it, it, exactly what you said. It's just you got to find what it means to, to have different goals. You, I'm not going to be like, oh my God, I need to land triple cork or whatever. But there's still ways you can be relevant or even, not, not even relevant, but just enjoy tricking. Like, let's say exactly. you don't interact with a single fucking person. If I just go out there and I personally love doing corks, I could just swing cork all day. Nothing creative about it. Nothing crazy. But exactly. I You're not love recording it. it for anyone. You're just doing it for the feeling. That's perfect. Do yeah. that. And enjoy it. That's what I think. And, and and I'm sorry that I can't give more specific advice on what sorts of goals to choose at that point, but I really do think that that's because it is going to be very specific to you, right? You you are the one who knows how to recontextualize, how to how to change your perspective on what how your sessions look now to see yourself as you know the old wise man uh, who's going to be leading the next round of champions, or fuck it as the old wise hermit who's just enjoying life in in beauty and you know just appreciating ikigai it's like oh, wh whatever it happens mm -hmm. to be that's perfect or the drunk uncle at the gathering just chill absolutely <laughs> that's that guy. <laughs> yeah. see me and neo doing that <laughs> <laughs> a couple beers and i'll watch well, him well, and uh, go uh, at it 
I was tricking on the hot springs and Pollen walked up to me and is like, you're not drinking enough and just handed me the beer that he was drinking and made me chug it on the spot. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. That, that's kind of the vibe I go for at gatherings now. There's just that drunk uncle that just like, we'll talk endlessly about one topic and it's trick theory. Um, so... <laughs> I didn't. So. I didn't appreciate that character when I was younger. As I've gotten older, I see. I see the wisdom in it. It become. It, it, it's it, endearing. It <laughs> to me. Yeah, as time goes on. Yeah, absolutely. So pick your niche. Pick pick your uh, genre of person you want to be, and do that. So um. it also seems that as we as we age, we have to recontextualize the tricking gatherings or events that we go to because it's you know talking about recontextualizing how we approach tricking and that's fine but it also impacts like gatherings now we're no longer trying to display our best efforts you know we're now we're just trying to meet up with the homies and have a nice social time rather mm -hmm. than yeah, and anything RC yeah yeah it's funny because i think that happens as you get older so i actually just recently went to a spine conference and it was just a bunch of spine surgeons there's very few medical students so i was just like the fuck am i supposed to do here and i realized that it was just a bunch of homies catching up with each other like that's all they were doing like yeah they, they would talk about like different surgeries every once in a while they'd like look up tools but literally 90 percent of the time it was just them with their like wine and they would just sit they'd just be in a circle just like catching up and just like oh this is what gatherings are about when you get older <laughs> which it's funny just on like from the outside looking in because i mean just think about when we were you know, at least around peak ages and going to gatherings and then seeing older trickers that maybe you look up to and you you see them not tricking. They're just doing exactly like what we were saying. Mm -hmm. And then you, you think to yourself, I think at least, you know, I've thought about it, but I would think, uh, you know, why aren't these guys tricking? But you guys are mm -hmm. going to a gathering. I thought the point of going to a gathering was tricking. Mm -hmm. Then it's not until you get a little bit older, then you're like, okay, well, now I can completely understand you know, hanging around, having fun, seeing friends that you haven't seen for a long time, maybe throw in a couple tricks, but you're not there with the intention of, you know, trying to stop the craziest things. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I always had that mindset going into gatherings earlier. I was like, I need a trick at all moments. I need to have everyone look at my tricks and stuff like that. And yeah. and I couldn't fathom why someone wouldn't be tricking 24-7 at a gathering. And now I, I, I more than get it. So... <laughs> Yeah. Um, but I guess that does bring us to like the group aspects of uh, getting older and, just, you know, being in touch with the community. And oh, actually, one thing I do want to mention about gatherings is that I have noticed the shift in terms of like how gatherings are run as of lately, like compared to when I first started. And like something that I really noticed is they were... I, I hate to say it, but, like, a lot more hype. Like, a lot more, there's just, like, 24-7 something going on. And we would always have overnight sessions. There's no such thing as getting a hotel. Was, you, you're always just crashing there. Or maybe at, like, a trick or homie's house. There's no such thing as, like, you got a hotel. Now it's, like, people are getting Airbnbs and, like, partying there. And, and, and like, there's hype sessions. But usually they're, like, apart rather than, like, Jihad going in for, like, eight hours in the middle of the night you know like like way in the past so i don't know yeah i agree i think we used to see a lot of you know overnight gym stays and sleeping in just let's be honest terrible conditions <laughs> and now um and i think like tori put it best when we went to the last neo she was like i just want to be comfortable at a gathering like mm -hmm. I, i'm tired of you know sleeping in my own sweat on the hard gym floor and while there are some some appealing aspects of that, like you know the rhythm of like people, like you know bouncing on the floor, uh, at the same time, at the same time, you know, if someone like n nearly lands a triple full on your sleeping head, you kind of, you know, that can kind of get old. So. Right. I mean, I, I remember one Neo where there wasn't any more floor space, and so I just went into my car and slept in the back seat. And it's granted, this is like mid june in ohio very oh, humid and so i'm just waking up in like a you know baked sean spicy car i'm just sweating all <laughs> over the place but then i just can't i can't tell you how great it was to finally have like a hotel room for the first time mm -hmm. in a nice air-conditioned space with a comfy like hotel bed and something about just a hotel sleeps man it just oh, it yeah. just hits different than anywhere else even like my mm -hmm. own bed 
for me, really, it's like the availability of like showers and showers huge, decent, <laughs> decent showers. Like, there's nothing more refreshing after a very like intense and sweat inducing session mm -hmm. than a nice hot shower to clean yourself off. And you know, kind of just waking up the next day, literally picking up where you left off is. And, and it's there's, disgusting. There's nothing that kills your motivation to go to a session more than realizing that after your session, you're going to be walking around in that sweat for the rest of the day. <laughs> Ooh, wow. Okay, yeah. I'm going to change my. I'm going to be a little bit more tactical about this. I think. You know, it, it felt like a rite of passage, though. I will say, I've been to a few gatherings. Yeah, it, you. Yeah, you have to do it at least once. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Just let go of all your like needs as a person you're just gonna be starving you're gonna be sweaty yes you're gonna be oh my god how much gonna... weight what what is the most amount of weight you guys have lost at a gathering i have not weighed myself, myself. I, but yeah i can't you ever say weighed yourself before and after okay anybody who everybody who ever goes to gatherings ever this is what i want you to do because this is a lot of fun it's also kind of scary <laughs> weigh yourself before you leave for the gathering and then weigh yourself immediately after you come back you're gonna and... give people eating disorders Oh my god. Well, I'm not going to give you eating disorders. I'm going to give you some impression of just how much scary amount of calories you're burning when you go to a tricking session. Right. I have yeah. there's almost no way to eat enough food at a tricking gathering to make up for the amount of energy that you're losing. I yeah. don't remember which gathering it was, but I came back and I have lost 10 pounds. Oh my god. Eating That's pounds crazy. <laughs> some people are like trying to do that with like diet and exercise and they can't pull it off. Yeah. <laughs> Just go to a trick and gathering. Obviously. Seriously, that's it. Starve that's yourself it. and do nothing but train for a couple of days and you will lose weight. Yeah. I will that's... say though, when I first started tricking, like even though I was doing obviously only basic things like V-kick, hooks, and tornadoes, it was like the most physically demanding and exhausting thing I had ever done at that point. Mm -hmm. Like I could remember distinctly like doing one of my first backyard sessions and just realizing how tired I was and like how sweaty I was compared to doing like other activities and I used to do like a little bit of long distance running and obviously you get sweaty doing that but like this was like advanced sweat so <laughs> this isn't your normal everyday sweat this is <laughs> advanced sweating <laughs> exactly oh gosh um yeah I think a lot of that also has to do with novel body movements is something i've noticed because like now even now like whenever i'm out of training like i could still go back and do corks and it's not super physically demanding but i agree when i first started tricking holy fuck that was just like figuring out what muscles have to fire at what time and what other muscles that aren't on my leg have to trigger it was just it's exhausting so i agree I'm gonna, I'm gonna sidebar us back on topic here for a second. Just yeah, thank you. I'm thank curious you. about it, but um, we we're we're trying to talk here about some of the group group aspects, the social aspects, the interaction aspects of what it what it what it's like to get old. And now we want to come into this with some positive perspectives on what can happen and how this can go well for you. But I but I think it'd be a little fun to discuss maybe how it can go not so well so are there any examples that anybody can think of of not aging gracefully in the community not you know taking your place on the higher rungs of the ladder as you get up in years i, I feel like been... you're serving up a softball for your favorite tricker brace oh no no, no i'm not <laughs> i'm not gonna do it I, I won't do that but i i definitely there are a couple of things that come to my mind there, there's a few trickers that i could think of um and it doesn't necessarily need to be a specific trigger. It could just be yeah. a behavior pattern that lots of triggers engage yeah. in. But I, I think one of the biggest behavior patterns, and we saw this in the previous generation, is like grasping really hard at your relevancy. And the way that uh, presented itself in the generation just before us, like the really martial artsy triggers, was uh, trying to stay relevant by telling the younger generation like us that like if we're not kicking, we're not tricking. And I think that was like, they would say that because they're like, oh, our kicks are cleaner, so that's why we're better. But like, everyone, else, like, the younger triggers are just objectively doing harder things. Like, I'm sorry. Like, and they have more kicks than you think. Like, I don't, it was such a weird thing because a lot of triggers would still have really good kicks, even when they were twisters. So, mm -hmm. like, I, but, I yeah. remember, sorry, I remember Sam getting roasted for his hook kicks so much. 
And it was such a weird thing because I'm like, his nine is immaculate though. Like why is this well, such a weird thing to nitpick? Also, his his hook kick was made for a specific purpose. It is mm -hmm. the exact perfect way to get yourself into a master scoot. You can't find one that more properly sets you up for the master scoot swing. And so, yeah, if you're looking at it from the perspective of this kick is bad at looking like a traditional martial arts hook kick, then yeah, you'll come away with it looking bad. But if you're looking at it like, this thing is a fucking purpose-built weapon to get you into a master scoot to unleash ridiculous amounts of nuclear power, then you have to look at it and be like, well, it's the best hook kick we've got. Because objectively, at that purpose, it is. But yeah, and so, but yeah, the, uh, yeah I, I agree. I thought that that aspect of the last generation attempting so desperately to exercise some degree of control over the direction that tricking was going in by saying, mm -hmm. you know, if it's not tricking, if it's not kicking, if you're not kicking, then you're not tricking. They're, they're desperately trying to set the standard for what it means to be tricks so that simultaneously they can maintain their position in the hierarchy as mm -hmm. the top dogs. Uh, but also so that they can make the decision where everybody else in the community is going to go in the coming generation. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, by doing that, uh, they had the precise opposite impact, right? They they wanted for us to all go in the direction of martial arts tricking to view kicks and other things like them as the pinnacle of what tricks we could learn. And as a result, they are much less important to us nowadays than twisting and other things. And that's just a fact. Um, and so uh, as I was saying to these guys earlier, uh, this is objectively unintelligent because what it means to be intelligent is that you can select um, you, you can select goals, instrumental goals. Those are things that help you get your terminal goals. And you can choose instrumental goals in such a way that your terminal goals end up getting executed. The things that you actually want to happen have, ha have happened. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the people from the previous generation managed to pick a set of instrumental goals, telling everybody else that if you're not kicking, you're not tricking, that were so bad that they had the precise opposite impact on the community. And now the community is going in the exact opposite direction that those people intended to have. Hence, th those people uh, are profoundly unintelligent. Uh, so that what was Chris's we way of saying that they're stupid. Anyway. Exactly. <laughs> Literally a, using a the way to say get yeah. fucked. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and by the way, you can't argue with me because I'm using the definition of intelligence here. So like it's right. not a, it's not a matter of I think they're stupid. It's no, no, no. I've just proven that they're stupid mathematically. <laughs> Oh my God. So, well, and, and the approach is like fundamentally flawed as well because you're coming in confrontationally you're like you're mm. not doing what you think you're doing and that's just not absolutely. the way to get your point across absolutely yeah. so uh, uh, the the point of spending so much time on this is i really think there is a lesson to be learned here right there's, mm -hmm. there's something important that happened when these people tried to exercise that control over the community for their own benefit it was mm -hmm. the wrong thing to do, and it led to the precise opposite outcome that they had intended. Yeah, so exactly. For those of us who have designs on being a part of the community in the future, and maybe even influencing the direction that it takes, mm -hmm. the last thing you should try to do is jump up, declare yourself the gatekeeper of tricking, and tell everybody else what is and isn't tricking. I can yeah. guarantee you, just from his, just from the historical evidence, that is a way to guarantee your irrelevance in the next generation because yeah. it did for all the people who did it in the previous generation. Yeah, it, it's funny because you're talking about that now, and I'm just going to name this person by name because uh, Michael Guthrie is is a really big name and deserves to, uh, I guess, have his ideas dissected. Um, but I, I think he's a really good example of not aging gracefully. Be, that being said, he's still very talented as a tricker, but there's going to be a time when he's not. So the, the fact that he's still really talented still gives him a little claim to relevancy. But the moment that goes away, people already know how like should he even like like he's a dick like he's a dick online like the latest post he made where he was just like oh you're you know if you're not going to las vegas you're not like a real tricking gathering you have i wish he would just like, stop putting his huh? fucking foot in his mouth <laughs> god damn it. it's just you're just really grasping at straws to be relevant and it's it's weird it's and it's it's so interesting because i feel like uh, I mean, maybe I'm biased, but I feel like my generation, our generation does it really well. Like, I think we've been aging really well. Like, everyone 
that I used to trick with is not salty about where they're at in tricking. It's not like they're just enjoying tricks and they they still show up to gatherings every once in a while and hang and chill. I think Guthrie's just like that outlier example of like, dude, you gotta chill. Like, <laughs> okay, but in in his defense, when you mm-hmm. are the absolute and undisputed top dog <laughs> for so long. Like I mean, okay, yeah. I, I, to be honest, it's it's really indefensible. But watch me defend it. Um, <laughs> it's just that, like, I mean, I gotta give him at least some credit uh, mm-hmm. because, like, you know, the man does deserve it. If there's like a Trigging Hall of Fame, Mike's the first person. No, on that no list. one can yeah. take that man's awesome. accomplishments away from him. Nobody Absolutely. can like he wasn't the best. But that doesn't mean we can't pretend that the way he's acting right now is anything. He's not exactly being magnanimous. And it would be really easy for him to be magnanimous, and that's probably the most disappointing thing. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, there are lots of folks from our generation who are doing what I I would suggest instead of gatekeeping, Mm -hmm. uh, which is to be role models. There are lots of people who, instead of suggesting that other folks aren't part of tricking or aren't good trickers because they don't do everything that they say, which I'm, you know, is a great way to make lots of friends. Instead mm-hmm. of doing that, they just go around displaying the behaviors that they want other trickers to engage in, that they want them to feel positively about. Um, mm-hmm. And as they encounter more young trickers who look at them uh, fo- and then look up to them as they see them to be good people, the more those behaviors will disseminate through the tricking community. Uh, so there are absolutely there are lots of people who are doing that amongst our generation and even a couple who did it amongst the pr- previous generation. Mm-hmm. Um, Scott Skelton being one of the people who comes to my mind immediately when I think of people from the past generation who mm-hmm. who were incredible role models. Yeah. Uh, but he, he took up that mantle as like, oh, the person who landed triple cork, who became like an icon of tricking. But he didn't do it to a degree that it was, like, full of himself where he was just like, I'm the main character of Tricking or anything like that. It was just like, you know, I know I'm one of the big names and I'm going to talk at all these gatherings. I'm going to do all this stuff. But I'm also not going to act like I'm the best tricker in the world. Because Super humble guy. I met him. I literally met him once at a New Heights gathering. But mm-hmm. it was it was one of the things that came across. You know, you, you can talk to all trickers, even high level ones like they're normal people. But Scott Skelton. Despite the, how interesting that man's life is, go ahead and ask him for some stories about his life. It's goddamn interesting. Despite how interesting his life is, despite how absolutely accomplished he is in the sport, he's just a he's just a humble dude. Mm-hmm. And like that, that sort of thing, I honestly believe that it's one of the reasons why you see so much uh, carefree and humble uh, humility throughout the tricking community. I honestly think that's a lot of people who saw Scott Skelton and are emulating his behavior. And good, you know, absolutely. good on them. Now, though, I will say that I've seen that taken to an extreme by some people, and I'm not going to name any names, who, <laughs> uh, like, see Scott Skelton, and then they try to emulate that that oh, persona, yeah. like, mm-hmm. really hard. Um, probably to, like, a, you know, just an uncomfortable amount. It's like, hey, just, man, you, you know, know, imitation is the highest form of flattery. It just happens to also be the highest form of cringe. <laughs> I'm going to, like, hang that up on my wall. That's hilarious. <laughs> um, so someone that we actually didn't talk about uh, in our notes, I guess, or our pre-planning, but I do want to bring up is uh, Neil Toussaint. I think he's doing a great job, too. Like, he what, he was really good at tricking. He even landed triple cork. He was, like, you know, pretty good for his time and held some gatherings, and they were bangers. And now he's a physical therapist, and... He is exactly what you're saying, like setting just positive role model kind of vibes for like everyone in tricking. And and you can see very clear, like, okay, people are a lot more conscientious of like how they're taking care of the body. And I think at least in part, it's because the trick's strong. So absolutely. There's it's something that I've kind of noticed over the years, like the growing community of people in tricking who have learned recovery skills and then like give back to the community like they they simultaneously give back to the community uh because they sort of offer their skills at gatherings but in a sense like they they through uh, through being a part of the trick tricking community and being exposed to this passion like they've got a, a life skill from this mm-hmm. like they've got a job an occupation that they can go engage in it's, it's one of the coolest things that i think coming out of tricking is like the actual ecosystem developing in that way so that we could slowly become 
self-sufficient, take care of ourselves and have the services that trickers require among trickers. That I think sounds like a really cool thing. Absolutely. So uh, Sean and Jason, is there anything, do you want to roast anyone? Do you want to praise anyone in tricking? <laughs> for yeah. I, don't, I don't want to roast anyone, but shout out Matt Milhone. Yeah. Runner of Neo Motion, Neo Gatherings. He's been my dad, my tricking dad since 2011. Wow. Um, and I think it was even prior to really thinking about that idea of becoming a tricking instructor and opening up a tricking studio. Um, he was already kind of doing that just with the newer generation of the SUTF guys, people that we all grew up you know, watching and tricking with together. And so I think he already had that uh, incubating for a while. And then, you know, finally after you know, having 10 years spent with him and with us all together, him looking after us, kind of taking that, you know, philosopher role or wise older man role, mm -hmm. um, you know, he was able to turn that into a successful business and something that's, mm -hmm. you know, directly benefiting the community uh, the right way and, you know, curating the next new generation that's coming up. Yeah. I, I did feel you. foolish not to have mentioned uh, Matt because he is a, an, another really great example of someone who's contributed to the community and also maintained like a, you know, a positive outlook on the the changing of times and tricking because he was he's been a little bit he started a little bit before um you know we did but he was also like one of the first few people to do dub dub and i remember that was pretty significant so mm -hmm. and it cannot be said that he is not relevant to the community <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. If, there's, if, there's anybody, if there's anybody from the prior generation who has maintained their relevance in tricking fucking matt malone the dad i mean 10 years of like having a bunch of people come to fucking ohio or michigan like Fuck that Fuck that <laughs> think of how many trickers exist on planet earth nowadays and today because of mm -hmm. him and the stuff that he's been doing that's a very that, good statement. that blows yeah. my mind <laughs> yeah like... and, and that's i think that really goes back to getting old and tricking is like i i think getting old is also realizing that some uh, not even sometimes i would say 80 percent of the time having an impact in tricking is not about being a really good tricker it's more so about doing stuff for the community or being nice to people or making friends or whatever it might be you know yeah your impact on the tricking community if you actually never did any tricks yourself and just only study tricks and taught other trickers mm -hmm. uh you could easily have a greater impact on the tricking community than even someone like mike guthrie after just a couple of years yeah in, in the wise box. words of Scott yeah. Skelton, um, what? Hang on, sorry, I'm trying to remember the <laughs> <quote. gonna>, it's, <laughs> it's not about your tricking. Can't even tricking the doesn't need your ability. Quote. Yeah, tricking needs tricking your spirit. Needs your spirit. There you go. <laughs> sorry, go on, Bryce. <laughs> but yeah, I was I was gonna say that like the guy who's teaching Shosei, people mm -hmm. don't talk about this very much, but like that guy doesn't post videos of himself tricking. Yeah. But That's point true. to. Me, Point, point to be another person without a sampler who's had as much of an impact on the sport of tricking as the person who coaches Shosei. You can't do it. Yeah, that's a good point. So, yeah. So and if, Michael and Guthrie, if Michael Guthrie watched, walked up to Shosei's coach and started bitching out, you know, like, ah, oh, you're not even a real tricker. You don't do shit. I'm sorry, but I would have to take up Sh Shosei's coach's side in that argument because objectively, like, he's the mm -hmm. future. You're not. Yeah. Exactly. The future's now, old man. Um, <laughs> you're on your Price way out. favorite phrase. <laughs> you're it, on it, your way out. I love it. It's just, it's so accurate. I'm sorry. It's just, fi find your thing. Like, you don't even have to, like, be a productive member of tricking society. Like, I, it's not actually that deep. It's just, like, if you're just a good person and you just like tricking, like, that's good enough. You're just not an asshole. You don't even have to be, like, the best person. You don't have to be great either. You could just not be an asshole. Mm -hmm. and, and then that's really it. That's kind of the the baseline yeah. yeah so it makes tricking a better place i like i like positivity and tricking at least i don't know i i don't like it when we get into all the like oh no i'm better than you and like get into all these negative fights or i, I don't know like the showmanship type shit i it's not the worst thing in the world but i'm also just like not the biggest fan i just i i came to tricking because everyone's like super nice and likes to be friends and shit like that so you know 
That's just yeah, it was, uh, I don't remember who said it, but it's like uh, the the three things that make you great at something and it has nothing to do with your skill in it. And it's your passion, your humility and your openness to new people mm -hmm. like that in tricking. It's like if I had to pick someone who is good for the community as someone who's passionate about tricking, someone who's humble and someone who's open to new trickers coming in. Mm -hmm. And what what's really critical about those three things today could be your first day tricking. Mm -hmm. You could have all three of those things. That's true. That's a good point. And and I've always gotten those vibes from trickers. It's like, it doesn't matter how new someone is, if they're a cool person and they have like those three traits you just mentioned, it's like they're very openly accepted into the community and people will get excited when they do a new trick or whenever they learn something new or whatever. Oh yeah, tr tr tricking is famous for having people explode over somebody landing a fucking backflip. Like, yeah. We're famous. So. Exactly. So... Yeah. Um, is there anything else you guys want to mention about getting old and tricking? Hmm. Just random thoughts or anything. Uh, don't do it. it. Don't do don't. it. Don't. Yeah, it's, it's not a good idea. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> if, if, if you're allowed to sign up uh, for it every year, you just, just sign up for not aging. Yeah. Hit, hit me up in 20 years. I'll give you guys bionic knees and we'll be fine. So. Looking forward to it yeah <laughs> um so the last thing i do want to ask you sean is uh you are involved a little bit in planning for neo and specifically kind of like the selection process for guests and i feel like probably fans of our podcast would be interested in what that even looks like like you know what could i be doing better to to go to neo because it's something that i have loved about neo and i expressed this to you guys before we started the podcast but um I always meet new people that I had no fucking idea existed. Um, and it's always a good time because of that. And it, I didn't realize it till now because it was a very subconscious thing. But that was one of my favorite things about Neo. So I guess if you could give us insight into that a little bit. Yeah. And um, I think in order to do that, I think it's it's good to paint a picture of what I think the initial guest list, maybe you say first Neo was, which... I think in a lot of trickers' minds, if they think about planning a gathering, it's, you know, getting the right guests because, or the proper guests, the high profile guests, because in anyone's mind, and it, you know, it makes sense if you think about it, where the higher talent that you have there, the one that has a lot, the people that have a lot more pull, have a lot more notoriety in the tricking community, you can, you can be willing to bet there's going to be a lot of people that would want to show up to your gathering because of the guests that you have. And for a while, I think that's been, you know, how probably any other gathering around the world would operate. Let's get top guests right now. Let's get Mike Guthrie. We'll get Jose. We'll get, you know, whatever triggers, Phil Gibbs. And mm -hmm. while I think that's helpful, um, if that's constantly your guest list every single gathering, I think there's a certain point where you, it loses its, its luster. Mm -hmm. And something that we were that we considered and done, I think. I think all the way up, I think starting with maybe Neo two or three was just looking at underground trickers that we've seen like either via Instagram or Facebook, um, even through word of mouth and seeing these guys and they don't have much of a following, but they deserve that much of a following. And mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it was nice for us because then especially just for the name of Neo and how Matt and Sam were able to launch that into the stratos like stratosphere as one of those, you know, premier gatherings to be at. Um, being able to find those underground killers, especially for the aspect of for you know, in terms of fiscal sense, it's gonna be a lot less to get someone, you know, say, I think at one point Cameron Sharma, I think for Neo four or five, mm -hmm. you know, relatively relatively known, but he from what I recall, wasn't at a gathering and especially wasn't a guest at a gathering. But, you know, for, for Matt, it was an easy decision to make because you can have, uh, I mean, obviously, in terms of a guest, if you're a guest, it means you have your travel accom accommodations covered, uh, your lodgings covered, most likely your, your food, and maybe a little bit of money on the side. And that's something that a lot of trickers especially the underground ones that ha don't have any kind of that have never been a guest before that just sounds like the dream i think that's probably what anyone would want to you know be able to do go to whatever mm -hmm. gathering you want essentially for free maybe make a little money on the side trick all you want teach some seminars provide value um mm -hmm. so for them it was a lot easier of a decision 
for Matt and Sam, it's a lot easier of a decision to make where get a guy out there that is, you know, under the radar, a lot cheaper for us to bring in. And I think provides a lot more pull, I think, than sometimes your, your bigger name trickers that, you know, can maybe cost double the amount for someone like, a you know, a Cameron Sharma at the time, um, yeah. which is something that we've been I think we do a lot more now um, than ever before, just mm-hmm. for the fact that even two, it's I guess if you had a choice between, you know, three big trickers or 20 relatively known trickers and bring those two together, would you rather have 20 trickers that, mm-hmm. you know, are willing to just pull out all the stops and have the time of their lives or mm-hmm. three trickers that may or may not trick and get to dump a lot of money to bring those guys in as opposed to 20 other guys that are hungry and ready to provide for the gathering? I yeah. mean, it's, to me, it's an easy decision to make. It's, it's, it's seem, it seems like a really easy decision, even if you wanted to be like really cold and calculating and be like, all right, what are the, what are the odds that any one of these individuals is going to be actually a good guest of the gathering? With 20 of them, you just have higher chances. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, and we, we've had a bad luck of like a bad string of people that we would fly out internationally. Um, Alex D got hurt, I think, yeah. first cork or some shit. I remember. I remember. Yeah. Like, I, walk the the yeah, I walk into the gathering. Yeah, I walk into the gathering, and he already has like an ice. Uh, he's already icing his ankle, like sitting on the couch. I'm like, hi, it's hey, oh shit, it's Alex D. <laughs> he's just pissed. Because <laughs> yeah. he's, he's, but then think about how much money that it had to cost Matt just to bring him out there, and he's you know one cork in, and he's done so. So he's just hanging out. So I think yeah. the year after that, Thomas Merriman, similar thing that happened too, and yeah. it's probably probably still like a probably a learning opportunity then for matt and sam thinking all right it's going to cost a lot of money to get a lot of international people out there and if there's a chance that these guys get hurt and just you know all that money is just wasted you know Mm -hmm. like what you're saying bryce you know you probably have a better bet heading 20 other guys that is a lot cheaper to bring out that are ready to go i think chances are maybe at least 15 of those 20 guys are probably going to be tricking Hopefully. Yeah, e- all even f- of them are hurt. <laughs> like <laughs> guys, and they're all their ankles are busted. Oh my <laughs> god! E- even from like a social aspect, though, it, it makes more sense because it- it's like you have more people. A so there's more people to like for I guess prospective trickers or newer trickers to talk to. But B like when you only have a few high profile guests, they're gonna be surrounded by their homies the whole time. They're gonna be surrounded. It- it's a lot. There's a big barrier to entry especially for a newer tricker who might not feel as comfortable to approach such a big name tricker. So, well, especially so, when they're squatted up as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're with the homies, which is understandable. They want to hang with the homies. Um, but you know, some people look at tricking uh, gatherings as like a social event where they're able to talk to like maybe some people who are more famous in tricking. So having those 20 relatively big guests, I think is uh, a good idea for that reason yeah and tips for anyone that's interested in trying to become a guest at neo it's i guess you just look at look at some of the triggers that we've brought in and the ones that we are bringing in uh i was you know pretty uh instrumental in getting uh you know like lucid tricking uh (laughs) uh, the The walmart dude (laughs) yeah yeah the walmart dude that does a dub dub dubs on the in yeah inside walmart next (laughs) to the deli aisle (laughs) like so good i don't think i've ever seen him at a gathering before and i could be wrong but then Mm -hmm. We've never seen him. None of us have really ever met him before, I guess, besides Tommy Case, I think, from our group. But then, you know, we're thinking, <laughs> this guy, amazing tricker, but then just some guy that's just under the radar for whatever reason. But no one thought it would be a good idea to bring him out as a guest because maybe yeah. it's not, maybe, maybe it's the fact that he's not a big name tricker. But, mm-hmm. you know, for anyone that's trying to become a guest, it's, you know, biding your time, you know, continue to train, continue to be, you know, a positive force in the community. It doesn't even have to necessarily be about your skill level in order to bring you out there. It's just what other value that you provide, even outside of your, you know, abilities. I mean, the same way that we brought um, Sam Imsong, if I'm saying that right, Slinkin. Yeah, yeah. Um, while he's a good tricker, we brought him out a couple of years back because of just the influence that he has over the tricking community as a whole. And I'm sure he Absolutely. was instrumental in bringing a lot of people in there. He's just a good vibe. Mm-hmm. I so agree. It, I think it's it's just you know keep on doing your thing, and you know you're bound to get seen you know at some point. It's just you know definitely post it. Yeah, definitely definitely post it so yeah that they post can, your shit too. That yeah. will help. 
Oh wow. <laughs> Speaking of, he, he got he got mentioned in passing. And I just felt like I had to say this. Uh, Thomas uh, Thomas Case, young Tommy, uh, excellent excellent example of horizontal progression. If you guys uh, aren't sure, aren't clear on what that means, go and watch mm-hmm. his watch his samplers, his videos from the last couple of years. Uh, mm-hmm. Study study some horizontal progression. Love those videos. That that's something I failed to bring up in the physical aspect that I actually uh, was planning on bringing up. But yeah, that is super important with getting old and tricking. You might not be able to, I mean, you, you can vertically progress to an extent, probably not as much as you were able to in the past, you know, hit that next triple cork, hit that next spin or whatever it might be, but is very much in your ability to like, oh, let me do some reverse owls and do some weird transitions out of it. And then do like, that's totally something you could do. And it, it definitely age. I mean, look, actually Alex Hunter is the prime example of that, that it ages you really well in tricking. Like he's, he's a fine wine, you know? So, finest. Yeah, he's getting, he's, he's getting close to vinegar. I'm about to be able to put on my. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay, but anything else you guys want to bring up for closing remarks about getting old, about Neo? I'm hyped for the guy. Uh, go, go, go to Neo before you get old. Once yeah. you get old, you you know keep going to Neo. But definitely before you get old, definitely do it at least once. Well, just just probably, to, you know probably more it. than once if you can help it. Just to make it clear, this is the final. The last Neo. Yeah. This it is. is. So you have to go now. You have yeah. to go in yeah, like, you, like uh, literally two tomorrow. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, ho- I'm hoping just from describing, you know, us getting underground killers. I hope any gathering host or someone that's considering being a gathering host look into mm-hmm. something similar to what we did because I think it, it provides a lot more value out of your gathering than top like three top tier trickers or something like that um yeah. that being said uh looks like you're not gonna be a guest at, like it looks like those underground people or <laughs> anyone that wants to be a underground killer guest at neo uh probably won't happen this year and well you know but i'm, I'm sure you guys will do things in the future gathering related it's just mm-hmm. neo is not going to be continuing but you know yeah as far as neo is concerned everybody you know charter your boats uh steal your planes get a car and drive to ohio yeah absolutely. michigan but yes, <laughs> well, have, it's not it's not in Ohio anymore. No, it's uh, oh, it's the past, uh yeah, You're past an old two head. three years. Yeah. Oh man, All right. I have been been out of the loop. Back in my day, Neo gathering. was in Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> now this new generation has it in Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute snowflakes, it's dude. Even fucking yeah. colder. <laughs> God damn it. Oh my gosh! Yeah, you've been out of the loop for a second, Bryce. No offense. Uh, it's At least been it's happening in Michigan the last three years. <laughs> I mean, maybe three years. I don't know. I don't know the exact number, but um, yeah. So I, I mean, even the advice you gave Sean, though, I think uh, more so I meant it for like, oh, this is stuff that can still help you get into other gatherings because yeah. I'm sure other gatherings are also uh, using similar criteria at least. So um, yeah. Um, but yeah. So don't get old and tricking. That's the takeaway. Um, that's really it. That's all. Yeah, can. Find the fountain of youth. Mm-hmm. If you, if you all remember the last crusade everybody's watched indiana jones right yeah go find that holy grail and you'll yeah. be fine yeah or just start golfing like sean does so that's so sick all the boys are all the boys, <laughs> the <next transition. laughs> all the boys. <laughs> i mean we still love tricks and we still love watching tricks and going to gatherings but mm-hmm. golf is golf is getting up there god he's so yeah, that... fucking old <laughs> it's god. I know <laughs> the worst thing to bring up at the very end of this episode, but <laughs> I was going to say that I did uh, when we kind of discussed having you on as a guest, one thing I enjoyed was your attitude towards moving out of tricking. Like, mm-hmm. like you said, it, it you, you made it so that it wasn't a very big deal. Like for me, it's something that I struggle with. It's like, you know, I, I, I cling to my identity as a tricker and what that means. And like, you know, previous performances or whatever, but like when you're like you know so ingrained into the tricking culture as you are because you're like literally in the center of like the u.s's tricking culture um and and to hear you say things like oh dude yeah but now golf is pretty cool and or Mm -hmm. and not be like concerned about it or you know it's it's no big deal like Mm -hmm. it's something that's kind of refreshing to hear yeah i mean i think any any anyone i'm sure probably all of us probably had that you know coming of age moment or that moment where you think you know like what we were saying earlier it's just you know there's gonna be a time where you're not gonna be able to do the things that you want to do via tricks and maybe you find different avenues with that inside of tricking or i mean just like any other you know 
sport or anything like that. It, it's it's a hobby to people, and there's mm-hmm. doesn't mean you just have to have you know one hobby in your life and make it your whole you know thing, make it your whole identity. There's you know plenty of other things that uh, that you can uh, take what you learn through tricks and do the same thing you know anywhere or anything that you want to do. It doesn't even have mm-hmm. to be a hobby. It could just be – it can even be like a career path or a skill or whatever that you want to and, do. I know this is going to hurt a lot of people's feelings, but you can actually just have like a casual interest in tricking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you can, I struggle you can, with that. <laughs> I also struggle with that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I started talking tricks. So I'm like, I still need to make my personality tricking. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. All right. Well, thank you for being on, Sean. It was a pleasure. Um and yeah, we'll talk again soon. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks for having me on. Love you boys. Hope to see you soon. Hopefully at Neil. Yep. <laughs> <laughs>